frequency 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 matters 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 Hello, and welcome to the Frequency Matters podcast. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I am well. How are you? Good. Great. Uh, Welcome to the Frequency Matters podcast, where we just discuss uh, sound and light frequencies and their impact typically to the human body. But today we're going to talk about the earth. And I'm your host, Kim Fendi. It's a pleasure to have you today. Can you please introduce yourself? Sure. I'm David Wechsler, founder of uh, electricfertilizer.com. And I've been researching and experimenting in the world of electroculture and what's now energetic agriculture for the past uh, 12 or 13 years or so. I love that. That's so fascinating. I just learned of this concept about a month or two ago, and I've been just fascinated by it. Um, of course, it's, I live in Ohio, so we're getting ready for garden planting and this is just such a perfect right. time to have you. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. It's a, it's a great time to get started with a uh, springtime. You could start in addition to planting your gardens, you could start putting uh, simple electric culture appliances into your yard and give it a try yourself. Awesome. So uh, where are you located? So I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. Okay. Um, originally from New York. All right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, so how did you get in onto this topic? I was on your website. I saw you started in high school, kind of discovering this this process or the, the fact yeah. that the soil responds. So just tell us a little bit. Sure. Um, basically, the, the origin story was I was always interested in high voltage. As a, uh, as a kid, my parents bought me a, a mini Van de Graaff generator, which is the thing that they have at science museums. You put your hand on, make your hair stand up, and <clears throat> and I uh, just love playing with that. And then eventually, I was in high school and I wanted to do work on another science fair project, and I came across this catalog that had something called an ion ray gun. I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. And so as I'm browsing through the catalog, I'm I'm purchasing this device and I'm doing research. I come across another catalog pre-internet days called Rex Research. So I got their catalog and within it, in addition to having a number of papers and articles on uh, on a high voltage in a general sense, they also had a number of papers on electroculture. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. So I, I bought them and I was like, oh, interesting. And I shelved it. And about uh, 20 years later, when I was eventually married and got into gardening and permaculture, we were growing some plants in the basement, some uh, Romanesco broccoli and cauliflower. And I'm like, ah, I'm an electrical engineer. How hard could it be? I'll give it a try. So in uh, about five minutes, I threw something together. We had tons of control plants. And I'm like, ah. so I took three plants, put them into a separate planter with the exact same soil and, and uh, hooked them up to some DC electricity from an old cell phone charger. And... Uh, within a month, it started to change. It started to look a little bit different than everything else. And as time went on, the changes were more drastic. So what blew me away was the control groups, they, after maybe a month, a month and a half, they were about this tall and they were light green in color. Uh, The leaves were like the normal size you'd expect, right? But the electrified ones, they were this tall and they were like this dark, lush uh, rainforest green, and and they were just happy. They were ecstatically happy with the uh, the electricity going through them, hmm. and it just blew me away. And so from there, I started pulling in my friends, my neighbors. I'm like, check this out. This is the coolest thing ever. And they're like, oh, there must be something else to it. I don't believe it. And I'm like, okay, I gotta research this more. So I go on the web. And uh, in the early webs at the time, uh, and for a very long time afterwards, there was really almost nothing about it. So the only people talking about it were cannabis growers. Um, and even then, there were a few people experimenting with it, just being creative. And 
people who would say that they had great results, other people would chime in and say, no, that's BS. I don't believe you. And I'm like, okay, I have to do a deep dive on this and figure out the science behind electric culture. And I'm going to write a book on it. And so that's what I did. So over the awesome. course of, yeah. So over the course of four years with a young baby laying on my chest, I'm writing the book on my phone. I, um, I pumped that thing out very, sl very slowly on a part-time basis. And uh, when I released it, there were, I, I was trying to sh share it with the world, share the benefits of it, the applications of it. And unfortunately it was just crickets. There were just a few other experimenters, mostly in France and Italy. And it was, uh, it was quiet for a very long time. And, and what that year was, was that? That was, the book came out in a, 2014. Okay. So not too long ago, especially, you know, you're ahead of your time. So now it's just catching up into the mainstream consciousness, maybe not even mainstream yet, but on the, on the rifts of the mainstream. Rifts of, rifts of mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's so exciting. What's the name of your book? Uh, here's my book. It's called Electro for the Culture. Okay. And it's available on Amazon. And I uh, have, have another book I wrote on electro permaculture, which is more about passive techniques. So this one talks about the science of electroculture. It goes into a deep dive into what it's all about from soil science to plant physiology, electrophysiology. It goes into the nitty gritty details. And it's important to know that stuff because then if you really want to get into electroculture, uh, knowing, knowing the science behind the scenes helps you with making it work out much better for you. Okay. So how does uh, how does knowing the science behind it make it work better for you? What would that change in as far as like setup or uh, well, process? Like there's some simple things like, um, for instance, knowing that it increases plant metabolism, that that causes that improves, that increases a uh, plant transpiration, direct correlation to transpiration, which causes the soil to dry out faster. And so if you're just planting your, putting your plants into pots and not paying attention and just doing things as normal, then you put an antenna inside of it or some other device to make it grow faster, you may not realize that you're going to be potentially killing your plants because mm -hmm. they're going to be drying out the soil much faster than before. Okay. So simple things. Um, there are, if you're going to be planting in the ground, for instance, knowing about soil resistance and it, that affects the the distance that the electric field travels within the ground so as you get into it there's there's layers and layers to it okay that's yeah. fascinating okay and your second book go on oh and the second book is about electro permaculture which is more about passive techniques using uh simple wire devices like um Lakowski coils which is basically just a loop of wire that overlaps itself, which is a uh, electromagnetic uh, oscillator. It's just, an, it's basically a uh, an inductor and a capacitor in the form of a coil, and it picks up radio signals and oscillates at a certain frequency. And if you put a plant inside that the center of that coil, the plants pick up on those magnetic energies, which is a good segue to what you did with frequency. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm a sacred sound facilitator. I use tuning forks, crystal singing bowls, and the various other tools and instruments, but mostly as a tool to help people become more mindful, more self-aware, more compassionate with themselves and with others. And really just so that we can all show up to in the world at, as our best selves. That's right. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, sound has uh, benefits to plants as well. A, a number of people have done research it, research on it over the years. Yeah. Have you done yeah. any, any of your own experiments on that? Uh, I have not. I, I have the bias of wanting to work with electricity and magnetism and, and subtle energies. Mm -hmm. So before I got into electric culture, I was really attracted to um, s subtle energies. I've always been a new age type of guy and and have always loved experimenting with playing with chi like chi balls yeah. like this 
and uh, I love that too. The forms of subtle energy. So what I wanted to do with this field was combine was ultimately to combine my interests with um, the hard sciences and the more metaphysical stuff. But back then it wasn't the right time, and now it's the right time. Yeah, I love that. So you mentioned um, that the antennas that you can, you know, the in the permaculture, electropermaculture, um, that it picks up the radio frequencies. And um, I'm just curious, I know there's so many being kind of blasted at us these days with 5G and everything else out there. Is that, how do you determine which frequencies it's picking up on and and how do we know those are good for the the soil and the plants well i think the well what, one of the things i love about working with plants is that they are they're rather simple in that if you try and experiment on plants and if you keep all your variables the same and you change one of the inputs then you'll know whether it works or not whether it's at least the plant thinks it's happy on the uh or gains benefit from it, at least on the short term, right? Not knowing the uh, the long term implications, it's, it's just a way of getting started. And so, what people are doing now, so I I have a group called the Energetic Agriculture Facebook group, and we have tons and tons of people experimenting with, presently using these various uh, spiral antennas. So I have an example of one right over here, and I'll be up close. So this is a simple spiral antenna that people are making. They became really popular out of uh, Italy about uh, three years ago, based on this uh, guy, uh, Igina, who was a uh, Italian researcher from, uh, I don't know, 50, 100 years ago, 50, 75 years ago. Okay. And, but the reality is it is this is just an antenna. It's just like a radio antenna in the form of a spiral. And the, uh, in simple forms, to, an to answer your question, the the wa uh, wavelength or frequency of the of an antenna that it picks up is a function of the length of the wire and the shape in which it is formed. So, if you have just a very straight piece of wire, depending upon the length, it's going to pick up radio waves based on the length. So, like a like a quarter wavelength would pick up the waveforms onto the antenna. Uh, the length of the wire, it'll pick up those the radiation that's coming towards it, and it'll direct it into, say, the ground, and the plant roots pick up on it. If you have the antenna in the form of a of a spiral or a uh, a cone like this, spiral cone, and if you have a very tight spiral, if you remember the really old cell phone antennas they used to have uh, that people had on top of their roofs, those are those were meant for picking up cell phone uh, signals in the gigahertz range. So. A piece of wire that's around this long, it's, it's I forget the term, whether it's medium wave or long wave, short wave, but that's not cell phone frequencies. That's not even close to 5G or okay. 3G. Right? <laughs> but if you have your antenna in a tight spiral shape that many people are experimenting with, they are basically inviting 5G into the front door. Wow. Yeah. If they put the so if they put that like in a plant right outside their house or yeah, you... but I I don't necessarily think that you know it's the honestly I don't know enough about five G I don't pay attention to that stuff sure. I live in a little reality distortion field of love and goodness excellent <laughs> but, but aside from that. What I think is if you're going to make an antenna like that and the way as the waves come in from just everywhere from, you know, we're bombarded with RF radiation from many sources, mm -hmm. from cell phone antennas to paging services to even natural sources like cosmic rays and sunspot radiation and so forth. If you have an antenna that picks up on it, it's just converting it to a very tiny little voltage going into your plants. It, it's really... If your plant is happy with the frequency or, I mean, at those levels, I'm not even sure that it's the frequency that really matters. It's really how much of a electricity is it picking up um, and sending into the dirt. Okay. So have you uh, found any um, lengths or designs that are harmful to the plants? Um, so or currents? I Yes, yes. So I have found some currents that are very harmful to the plants. 
Um, this takes me back to an experiment I did a number of years ago on my wife's newly purchased tomato plants. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and, <laughs> it, yeah, it was, um, yeah, th that was a source of drama for a while. But but basically what I was doing, so much of my research has been in the world of uh, low voltage DC electronics. Okay. And so in that particular case, I took some D cell batteries and I chose large batteries because I wanted to last a really long time. Mm. And so I put some D cell batteries into a waterproof case, put some electrodes in the soil, some distance apart. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to have really great tomatoes this year. And what I didn't realize at the time, and I, I should have, but and when we had our first heavy rainstorm, the what happens when you have a uh, normally the soil resistance getting into what we we're talking about before, mm -hmm. the soil resistance is not that high. It's maybe um, fifty to a hundred ohms of resistance uh, okay. between even a short distance. So as you grow out in distance, you have more resistance in the soil. Um, but what happens when you add a whole bunch of water to a to an environment that has lots of mineral salts and so on, it basically turns into a short circuit. And so basically I took these heavy duty flashlight batteries and went during that heavy rainstorm, it dumped all of its energy into the soil. Oh boy. Which killed not only my wife's tomato plants, but all of the plants surrounding it for probably uh, 10 feet in radius. Wow. So you kind of like shocked them. Like totally the, shocked them. Okay. Them. Which is not much different than like um, lightning, like a lightning bolt kind of striking. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess that's my next question with um, typically is your antennas made of copper? Is that correct? Uh, I use... I use different materials. Okay. So there's a lot of debate over whether you should use copper or aluminum. And, you know, I look at it from the point of view of you have antennas, antennas in the sky, um, antennas in your cell phones are probably made with copper because it's just, uh, it, it's more conductive, but you also have antennas on top of your roof for picking up TV signals or other types of signals and aluminum is cheaper. So you don't have to use copper. You can use any other metal. Okay. What what's uh, important is what the metal is going into the soil, and does that metal degrade as it when it's inside the soil, and does that have effects upon uh, the soil and the plants? Do the plants uptake the uh, corrosion output, mm. out, outputs of that of that metal? Okay. And you know anything in large quantities is not good for you, but I imagine for the amount of for the amount of uh, corrosion that's coming off of these antennas that it's very minimal but just something to be aware of yeah it sounds like more beneficial than harmful yeah yeah i would say so yeah okay and if you want to be extra careful about it then you would try to identify materials that are not as uh, ha harmful like um perhaps a like a carbon steel or hmm. some form of uh, graphite perhaps that you would wrap your antenna around and then and then place that in system into the ground itself okay so i've seen um most of the antennas that i've seen people working with just very very in my very short amount of time studying this is copper wire wrapped around a piece of wood and then that is placed into the ground can you talk about how your system is different or beneficial or whatnot so I, I work on many different systems. I, I, I'm a, I like to tinker and, and experiment and, make, and try out many different things. So the, the uh, spirals that are wrapped around sticks, like I said before, a, a tight spiral around a stick is essentially a cell phone antenna or maybe even a, uh, it's, it's basically some form of high megahertz, low gigahertz, type of antenna, picking up on cell phone radiation, very high frequencies and putting that into, uh, into the soil. Um, I do some experimentation with that. I also experiment with these uh, Lakovsky coils, which are that coil resonator I mentioned earlier, that's, that operates 
it's normally a coil around this wide. And that, I believe, resonates at around 100 or so kilohertz, megahertz. I should know these things, but I don't remember. But basically, <laughs> okay. small frequencies. But basically, the energies oscillate back and forth, okay. changing magnetic field. And when you place it over the plants, the plants picking up on this oscillating magnetic field that's going in and out, actually in an upward and downward manner. Hmm. And it responds rather well. But one of the other things that a lot, many people don't know about, and I don't think it's really come to a consensus within the community, because many people experiment, but not as many people are reporting the results. And I don't know if they're shy. It doesn't seem like people are shy on there. But they, what people need to realize is that plants have personalities. They, they all respond. Different plants mm -hmm. respond to different frequencies. Mm -hmm. they, just like we do as humans. Yeah, just like we do, right. <laughs> You know, just cause if you're if we're feeling sick with something and we we um and you apply some sort of frequency to our bodies, wh whether it's through a, a rife machine or some other healing mo modality, we're individuals with our own you know body uh, compositions, and th there's a lot of complexity complexity there. Mm -hmm. You may have to tweak and experiment moving those frequencies up or down to find something that really works for you. Yeah. And it's the same thing works with plants. Different plants respond to different frequencies and not only frequencies, different voltages, different currents, um, and probably even other aspects that we are, that we don't really know about. You know, there were probably subtle effects that come off of these, um, out of the, the electromagnetism uh, side of things. A lot yeah. of, there are some researchers in, you know, there's some historical uh, researchers. I can't think of this guy's name, like maybe a Reichenbach. And he talks about this thing called, he called an odic force. And I don't know what that means, but I believe it's basically was his terminology for what we would call subtle energy okay. in, in a sense. And he talked about how magnets, for instance, magnets or magnetic fields emit a uh, a flame a something that looks like a flame in, in the subtle energy uh fre frequency range that that uh, medical intuitives have the ability to see and perceive hmm. so i think ad adding that as yet another effect we don't and we don't know too much about that that could you know that's yet another angle that you know, let's say you dial in your electricity, you dial in your, your magnetic components. Maybe there's this other subtle energy component that affects whether it's working or not, or whether it's compatible with a given plant. Wow. So if you were, maybe this is completely wrong, but if you were to add a magnet to either side of that coil, perhaps, does that speed up the the current? Or am I understanding that in a weird, in, incorrectly or... Um, well, yeah, the, the, it, it depends. I mean, so if you have a, a magnet and you're adding it to, to a coil, it depends on what the coil is made of. If the coil is made of copper or aluminum, that that magnet's really not going to do anything uh, unless the only thing it's going to do is, it's, it, I think it's you're just going to pick up on the, if the magnet is on, say, at the top of a coil and the coil is six inches away from your plant, plants do respond to weak magnetic fields better than strong magnetic fields. So you may have this it may be working on the plant, but not in the way that you expect. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, I've got so many thoughts and ideas just like racing through as you're talking about all of this. Um, you said that um, the coil placed above the plant, like how are you, are you like hanging it from something or is it, well, tell me about that. So, uh, so George Lakowski, uh, when he did his original experiments, he would place the coil on on an angle of 22 degrees using some some sort of a wooden stakes or ebony stakes that okay. he would put the ground the coil coming out on an angle around the plant other people have made coils in various creative ways where they'll have a around a tree with wires or strings suspending the coil in, in midair which wow. i think is really uh, beautiful from an artistic point of view but at the same time, it'll work just with the coil straight on the ground. You don't have to okay. have it there. It doesn't have to be under the plant. It could be next to the plant in the middle of a bunch of plants. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you could have them, you could plant seeds in the middle of these things and have them all over the place. You could apparently even just put them on, on the branches. So I have an experiment growing uh, in the uh, in the community where I live. I tried to I tried it out putting it on the branch of a service berry tree that has a, there's a couple of trees in that region. And I put one on one of those trees. And as we approach June 1st, I'm gonna head over there, check out those berries and see if they're bigger or you know what changes are different on that tree versus the other ones. That's so cool. And I love that you're involving the community in that. Yeah, yeah. That's neat. Um, so one of the thoughts that I was that came to me while you were talking is that um, like we have tomato plants in our garden typically, and we put a, a cage around it to help support it. What that sounds like a cool opportunity to make that into some sort of a coil or spiral antenna to help support it. Have you done anything, any experiments with that? I have. Um, I, I've tried applying a s small spiral antennas to my tomato cages years ago. Um, honestly, I didn't get any results from those. But again, it's uh, it's you know what they say: your mileage may vary. It depends on the plants, the variety, the um, you know the strain. Yeah. All of those factors play a part in it. So the, the reality is, if you want to do it with spiral antennas. Oh, I lost. Physical... I'm sorry. Can you restart? I lost you for a few seconds. Oh, sure. So, if you if you want to do it right and find out what works with tomato cages, you you could try one. But ideally, you would have multiple tomato cages, some distance apart, so they don't affect each other, and try out different lengths of antennas, different types of antennas on there, mm -hmm. different spirals, if you will. You could get creative with it. And I think that's part of the allure and the fun of this whole domain is that it's. It's it's open ended, you know. It, there's a room for creativity and experimentation. It's kind of it's the wild west, actually, yeah. and it's, it's a lot of fun and a great opportunity for citizen science. It I, I think it is really neat because it it adds an entirely different aspect to gardening, which I think is such a, an important um, thing to teach children. I, I'm really big about working with children. And and um, teaching them these these things that I'm learning now at at my age that like if they knew this when they were little like how much would the how much potential could the world be just completely different better more peaceful so really trying to take what I'm learning now and teach children so thinking about gardening in this experimental way is just a completely new aspect that is very exciting I think yeah yeah it, it is a lot of fun. It's, it's held my interest for all these years. And it's amazing to me that after more than a decade, maybe a decade and a half at this point, I'm still not bored. I'm still excited to learn about not only these different energies, but it gets me involved with all different forms of science from not, uh, from uh, engineering to, to uh, plant biology and electrophysiology and then you go, if you study the history of it, you get into the archaeology and geology aspects of it, which as early on in my career, I was like, ah, whatever. But now I see that, you know, there's a connection. There's the, there's a, a connection to everything, how it's all related and how the ancients and the ancient knowledge and how they knew about how the world worked, maybe even better than we do. And yeah. it's fascinating. It is fascinating. So um, talking more about frequencies, since that's the name of the game here, um, what work have you done in playing music for your plants? And with antennas, have you noticed any impact? Um, I have I have played some classical music for my plants growing in the basement. Honestly, it wasn't the right environment because... I have, a, I have a small basement. I didn't really have uh, sound isolated rooms for for checking out, okay. have a control group and, and to see the difference. So I, I can't really say personally. Uh, maybe the plants enjoyed it. I, I'm sure they did because there there is a science behind them and listening to classical music or the sounds of birds chirping where it opens up their stomata and helps them uh, bring in more air. 
uh, and perhaps other effects as well. But um, it's interesting. I, in, in my in my research and just being curious about the subject, I found that plants also respond to heavy metal and death metal. Really? It doesn't matter the genre. I mean, or maybe the genre matters. I think honestly, I think it probably depends more on the intent or maybe the vibes mm. that go along with the intent of the musicians perhaps I mm. I believe that there is a a subtle energy more uh, consciousness based aspect to agriculture that we are not quite aware of its implications mm. so my partner Ray had he had a uh, a microgreen farm in Italy and he was doing it was doing well for a number of years until he got into a depression and then things fell the crop outputs fell i've experienced the same thing myself i've done experimentation for you know a really long time here and at at one point i had a falling out with a partner and i got depressed for a year and it took another almost year to get out of that and at, during that time most of my experiments didn't even work things that mm. have worked reliably for years wow stopped working and I don't know if I was doing things differently, if I was being sloppy, but I don't think I was. I think there's something, there's something there that we don't quite understand. Yeah. And so I think it's important that if you're going to be tending to your garden, you want to do it from a uh, loving, balanced space, as most that's, gardeners do. Yeah, that's such a beautiful sentiment and a perfect... Um... I don't know, segue is the right word, but um, I had uh, a guest on my show, uh, my last episode, Jonathan Goldman, and he created the formula in the 1980s, frequency plus intent equals healing. Oh, awesome. So we had really, really fabulous conversation yesterday about you can have frequency and, you know, it's all, it's all good. Sounds good. It's great. Uh, and you can have intent and and it's you can't you can't levitate or walk through walls with either one of those but if you put them together well we've seen we don't know complete truth how pyramids were created in some of those ancient megaliths but there's theories that sound and frequency is how they moved such massive objects and right. it takes both of those pieces to really have the power of of i guess movement in an action or manifestation to create something. So I think it is absolutely important to mention that intention and even the observation effect that I've, you know, in every experiment, there's this uh, level of, of observation or consciousness that can completely change the results, which is just fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's totally fascinating. And what's, it's cool that there's, I grew up hearing about some of those researchers long ago. Um, was it like uh, Greg Braden? And later on, I heard about uh, William, Dr. William Tiller, uh, who came out of Stanford. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he has since passed. But mm -hmm. he's done a lot of hardcore research into consciousness and intent and its effects on the physical world around us. So uh, there's a lot of really great researchers out there studying this exact topic yeah and i wonder if you put different intentions into the coils as you're making them if that's more of what is the energy being directed into the, the plants or the soil any thoughts on that yeah absolutely I, I you know there's people have been talking about crystal healing for thousands of years and i believe there's something to it um and i think you know as we we have the ability to charge objects using our consciousness or using other objects. You can use pyramid energy for charging other objects, um, oftentimes like fruits that's sitting in within a pyramid will will degrade slower than the that that is outside the pyramid, for instance. Um, but you, we can also pick up on the energy fields from these Im immaterial objects uh, in medical intuitives there are intuitives who work with the police who can pick up on energies from these from various objects and um i've discovered that i i myself can also pick up on on some of these uh crystal energies i find that i have to be really vibed up first most of the time 
But if I'm like in a really good high vibing space, then I could pick up on like this, this energy flow coming from these objects. And so it makes sense that if you could feel that, that from an engineering context, I think if you get vibed up and you get to the point where you're like in a flow state and you're feeling the tingles, the crown of thorns, the, um, you're feeling ready to go and all excited and you just take that energy and from the engineering point of view i would call that like a carrier frequency mm. like your your um your your cell phone frequency on which the information carries and okay. so if you get all vibed up to a very high level of carrier frequency and then you put in your intent on top of that and you direct your intent into these materials these these metals of which your antennas are made i think that can make a difference I get to experiment with it and try it out. And I would love to, um, but I think I think there's something to it. Please keep me posted. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do. Uh, I'm excited to see and hear. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you get vibed up? Um, I actually, I've been you know, ever since I saw that movie uh, What the Bleep a long time ago. I don't know if you're familiar with that. What the Bleep that we know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that that movie uh, rocked my world, as it did many, many others, and then eventually The Secret. And over the last, and even though those movies are quite dated, they've always stuck with me, and I've always been interested in law of attraction type of thing. Mm. But it was over the last probably seven years that I start to really dive into law of attraction and what go, what comes with that is the art of vibing up mm -hmm. and so basically i'm a huge fan of of uh, abraham hicks uh, publications and bashar other ch channelers okay. and from their teachings as well as the teachings of you know many spiritual guides over the years what i do to vibe up is uh, actually i've created a number of scripts that I, that I read every single morning and I and I repeat mantras to myself all day long not mantras necessarily in like Sanskrit or things like that although I do listen to kirtan a lot which vibes me up in itself but I I'm oftentimes just thinking loving thoughts about uh, actually the, what's interesting about Abraham Hicks publications is that the method they teach really works and it has to do with if you're feeling resistance in the moment, then you have to think of very general thoughts. Like, I appreciate the, I really like the greenness on the trees. I like the, the flowing lawns outside. I like the blueness of the sky. Just totally mundane, boring stuff. But you just think about that stuff you think about the little tiny things of everything around you that you like and enjoy mm -hmm. and then you event and if you what I do is I loop on it I say the greenness the greenness I love the greenness the greenness is just so it looks so good today and then the little intuitive thought will pop in your head it's more than I like the greenness I love the greenness and then from there another little intuitive thought will pop up and it'll sort of tune you upwards mm -hmm. into into uh, more specific thoughts like i'm feeling really vibed up right now I'm, I'm loving this experience i'm loving this interview i'm having a great time and eventually you just you, you start practicing talking to yourself <laughs> you pay attention to yourself your your emotional state from as a feedback mechanism and you are before you know it you're vibing high and good to go yeah so i mean i kind of believe i do believe that we are walking antennas and 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 even kind of a shift from the law of attraction is the law of resonance so we when we hold those thoughts we are resonating with more and more of that and and it's you have to actually feel it to manifest it it, it is you can't just say it and have it magically work although that is somewhat of like a backdoor approach because you know you say it enough eventually you'll feel it um but yeah i just think that is also fascinating and exciting yeah those i mean that's what they've been teaching for for decades you have to feel it you have to identify it with it 
like uh, for those who want to feel, you know, achieve uh, manifestations of wealth or or love by holding on to by one vibing up one shoe vibe up it that becomes the the carrier frequency for many things and from there <clears throat> if you then focus on the things that you desire and you think about the feeling of those things not i want the car but i want the rush of having a sports car i want the rush of feeling so in love with someone and you think about the feeling emotional words that go along with it I think that's where the magic comes in. Mm -hmm. And then you start feeling more tingles on you and there's more uh, vibe raising that goes on. And I, but the key is getting into that flow state yeah. first before you try to uh, connect with what your truest desires are or if you want to, in, or to in, imbue your energies into some material object. Yeah, so speaking of material objects, um like crystals mm -hmm. have you worked with um crystals on antennas or crystals in the soil on the plants i have but i think it was at a time when i, when I didn't really understand or have the new knowledge that I, i've gained over the last year or two so i haven't really done much um one form of crystal that i've had amazing the first crystal that i ever had a an experience with a uh, i don't know what the right word would be maybe shakti pot or some other um crazy experience with was a um a shiva lingo do, do you know what that is i don't so i have one here oh cool so this is a shiva lingam. okay they come from a certain river river in india and I saw one of these in a uh, in a store in Dallas many years ago, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna buy this thing and give it a try. And it was the craziest thing for me because I was on a work trip, and I bought this thing and had immediately. I mean, I hold it in my hand now, and whether I'm in a low state or a high state or any state, I just feel this massive wave of energy flowing through me. Wow. Um, it it just comes into me. It, it's like something I can't describe. It just it's like this soothing warmth, maybe love type energy that comes into my body and just covers me head to toe. And but the first night I got it, it it just got me all jacked up with energy. I was up almost all night. Oh, so, it, but it was it's a really cool. It, I mean, without having to do anything, this thing has a lot of power in it oh. and i don't understand it per se but it there's something special about these stones i have other size stones of these i, I, I want to buy a really really big one um at some point cool but i i think i think the uh the part i don't understand is how do you take the energy from this for, for as for instance and then apply it into your plants you could probably wrap coils around it and stick that into the soil I've yet to do a controlled experiment with it. I've placed these next to plants in experiments and I haven't really seen any results. Okay. It could be, you know, and I think ultimately it comes down to, you know, maybe these stones are tuned to the human body. These are maybe a gift to humanity and not necessarily the plant world. Hmm. You know, maybe this operates on a, essentially a different frequency of benefit. Interesting. To us the plants that's that's my view on it yeah so um that brings up some interesting uh, thoughts for me um let's see well i've worked with a lot of essential oils in the past um and have uh, how about you? Are you, do you are you familiar with essential oils do you use them i am i i don't really use them in a uh, energetic context okay. I, I i think they smell nice and you know okay. I've heard things are good for relaxation like lavender or what have you but so um, there's this a fascinating gigantic book on the chemistry of essential oils like this thick and it talks about how they work on us because our blood is so biologically similar to the plants that mm -hmm. the the basically it's the blood of the plant that you that is the oil that we're using on our bodies 
and that can heal us in the same way that it goes in and heals the plants. So I I think that's so fascinating. Um, and I, I think there is measured frequencies of each plant if you look at the oils like that. So I wonder if there's some correlation that you can, you know, somehow create specific sized coils to generate that frequency, like you were talking about, every plant's a little bit different and That's has right. their own frequencies. I wonder if there's something there. I think there is. I, honestly, I think there's, we're in a time of a great experimentation and innovation potential. Okay. There's one of the things I think about is how uh, is how there, there's a there was a researcher a number of years ago I can't think of his name but he did something very interesting where he apparently transported DNA or the the energetic aspects of DNA DNA over a distance and I don't remember the guy's name but basically and apparently this this experiment was replicated by other scientists. I haven't heard much about it. I don't know if it's a conspiracy thing or not, but it, it sounded interesting in theory. And the idea was you have a vial of, uh, I, I believe, water. Okay. And into the water, you put some sort of um, biological substance. And you put a, wrap a coil around that the vial of water and you put some frequency, some sort of carrier frequency, um, stimulating frequency into around the object. So that's creating a magnetic field within within that space. And maybe it turns on, energizes, and then then it reads. It, 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 it's hooked up to some sort of a sensor, if you will, those a coil of wire. And maybe they pick up some, what would seem to us like electrical noise coming from through the wires from the magnetic field. Maybe you're energizing at the you're you're magnetizing the substance and maybe in response the substance puts back some sort of magnetic signature through the wires that gets picked up amplified put into the computer and they record it and then what they did was they would send those audio files to someone else far far away and they would set up the same exact thing but instead of having the original biological substance in the water they put some sort of chemical in there that i uh, I totally don't know what I'm talking about here, but it was some sort of biological, some sort of maybe loose DNA, DNA concoction, DNA pairs that are not really formed in this solution. But when you apply the the signal to it, it created a, a an alignment of the DNA pairs in such a way that they matched the source biological material. Wow. Yeah. Again, I, I don't know. That's cool, but I, yeah, I have no idea how you do that. That's neat, though. Yeah, it, it was. I don't know. It just got me thinking. I thought it was cool. I don't know if it's absolutely real or not. Yeah. But I think there's something. Something could be said. Some experiments could be done. Perhaps wrap, whether it's wrapping crystals with coils and sending some um, electromagnetics through it, or doing it with essential oils too. You can put hmm. a, a vial of essential oils, wrap a coil around it send some signal through it and maybe the signal routes also into a plant i don't, I don't know it's, oh wow yeah but what's cool is you could you could experiment with these yeah. things it's easy anyone right. can do it and i think it, there's a um, opportunity to learn about how things are connected and yeah learn some science along the way and so what i was thinking was like if you know the frequency that a healthy plant vibrates at um, and you, well, I guess in isolation, which is not ideal in a garden, but essentially I'm wondering if you could play that frequency, let's say a couple hours at a time with the coil and then the coil is, it's directing that to the plant. If that would, um, just produce more health and vibrance for the plant. So, uh, to, so what you're saying is maybe there's a way to con to connect a, a coil to a plant in some way and take its life force and transfer it to another plant, perhaps a dying plant. And then you see maybe it would boost it up. Or yeah, something. yeah. Right. I, I think there's there's something absolutely to that. In fact, there's a uh, one thing I got into many years ago. There was a book called Biocircuits that is 
awesomely weird. And it has to do with it has to do with the with the creation of the there were a number of inventors in this area. One of them was uh, this person with the last name Eamon, uh, the uh, the Eamon circuit. And these involved copper or silk, but I've done I've done it with copper, copper pads. And so what you could do is you take these copper pads and you connect them with wires. Excuse me. And you would connect, say, a copper pad going from your left foot to your right hand, right hand, um, left hand to right foot, like making a cross. Okay. And there are other orientations also. And then you would, and by doing that and having also another pad going from your upper back to your lower back, by yourself, if you do it, you feel like this weird redistribution of energies within your body. It's really cool. It's very relaxing. It oftentimes, it would just put me to sleep, even though I would have the intent of just meditating in there. Okay. It was actually a similar feeling to what I felt from this guy. Huh. Yeah. Um, but what's cool is, relating to what you're talking about, some of the research that they did is they would take instead of having the circuit set up for one person, they would have the circuit set up with multiple people connected in series. One head going to one person's foot, another person going on another person's hand. Oh and what they found, if I recall correctly, is that I don't know if it went both ways, if it went from someone who was not feeling not so great to the, to the person who was feeling good or from the good person who was going in bad, but there was a, a transfer of state of uh, of physical symptoms from one person to the next oh my goodness really cool really really cool stuff yeah well therefore i think um since our bodies and biology works in that way in some way that we can't really comprehend i think it's possible with plants yeah um, and whether you would do it with the coils I, um plants apparently have um you know we as humans have many energy centers. You know, we have our chakras, major chakras, minor chakras, and some have spoken how plants have also have energetic sense, uh, um, sense uh, chakras, if you will. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I've tried to find more information on it. I don't haven't really found much about it. Uh, there's this idea with trees that there's this something called the front door of a tree. Hmm. Um, maybe some sort of energy center of the tree that uh, some people have the ability to perceive and pick up on. Um, so I don't know if that would work in a, in a general sense where you need to find one of these uh, chakra points of a plant to, hmm. uh, to, make, to make that happen. But conceivably, you could connect one plant to another plant. I mean, even a simple experiment, you could take a needle, a needle probe, stick inside of one plant and move the stick the other one inside of another plant and see what happens, especially yeah. if they have very marked, marked uh, differences between them. Yeah, that'd be really fascinating. Yeah, it would be. Especially if you took like um, basil cross with tomato or something. <laughs> oh yeah, great, great Like thought. make new combinations or something. Yeah. I, I wonder like, how that would affect the flavor. Yeah. It makes me think of uh, The Simpsons. They once had an episode about tobacco, huh? combining to uh, tomato and tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> They're so ahead of their time, aren't they? <laughs> totally. Yeah. Uh, so another thought that I had, and uh, back in the day, I used to call these like idea seeds or chunks. I just have to like say them out loud to really know where it's going. But um in about 2012 so going back to crystals um was kind of when i was first just like awakening to the the fact that there's so much more to this world that we don't understand i i literally i woke up one day and was like must wrap crystals with copper like that was the instruction in my head and it repeated until i went to the store bought all the things that i needed and was just like for like a week straight that's all i did it was kind of insane, <laughs> but I was like obsessed with it, like wrapping crystals with copper wire. I didn't know why, but it, after, you know, like doing it for a while, I understood like, okay, well, the, the copper wires, the conductor, the crystal is, um, it can hold information 
And while I was doing it, I was putting, you know, loving, healing intentions into it. So I'm, it's totally making me think if you pro, if you're programming your intentions into the crystal and you put that onto the copper or the antenna of some sort, it's, I would imagine it's constantly directing that frequency or intent into the, the plant and the soil versus just picking up what's out there not that that's a bad thing but i guess i'm just trying to under wrap my brain around is what is it more beneficial to use your own intent versus just pick up the ethers and what the, does the plant have that intelligence and just gets what it needs i honestly don't i don't know i think you're going to have a what's called a confounding effects because the mere fact of wrapping that uh having any piece of wire in the soil or attached to a plant in some way makes an antenna whether you want it or not want it to be that or not um if it was some other connection perhaps it would have less of an effect if you um if you maybe had i don't know just guessing maybe if you drill the hole into into the crystal and put a wire into the crystal um and then had the wire just come out right into the plant. And even then it still acts as an antenna, but maybe less so. Um, you'd have to try different things to isolate it if you really want to study it, to study that, that effect. But I think there's something, uh, there's something to that. Um, like, uh, let's see. And I, I think the, you know, the mechanism could be something that even though, you know, crystals are not, they don't, necessarily they don't put out uh, magnetic fields or electric fields per se um quartz does if you compress it it'll create an electric field piezoelectricity mm -hmm. but assuming it's like a non-piezoelectric type of crystal i think the fact that the crystals work on a on a subtle energy plane and then you have if you have um materials that can be magnetically charged like a like ferromagnetic wire, iron wire, steel wire. And I think that based on the work of uh, Reichenbach, where there was this flame, this, this magnetic subtle energy effect that came off of magnets, in my mind, I'm thinking that there's probably some sort of interface there, some sort of subtle energy interface between the crystal world, crystal subtle energy, and this wire that could be magnetized uh, area, and that could that could cause an effect. Hmm. Uh, so I so it may be a good experiment <laughs> would be uh, to have a, a crystal wrapped with uh, with uh, iron or steel wire, or, um, and another crystal wrapped with copper wire, and put both of those into a plant. Hope is to hope the plant is compatible with it, or ideally, so if a bunch of them go to multiple plants, find which plant is compatible with that combination. Um, put your intent and so forth into the plant. Maybe something involving, uh, I don't know. I wonder if you could put in the specific requests, like I'd like you to have larger, greener leaves, or make your leaves do something different, abnormal. I don't know, mm. but that would be cool. I think that yeah. would be the way to go about it. Yeah, it's so it's so fascinating. So, let's see what else. Um, what what advice? I think we'll start wrapping it up. So, what advice do you have for a um, I guess amateur in this field who wants to just start trying some things out? What can they begin with? So, I, I think we're in the middle or the very beginnings of an electroculture renaissance. It's, you know, like you said, we're we're on the fringes of the mainstream. And I think for, to get involved in this day and age, we have so much available to us, so many materials, so much science, so much knowledge that I honestly, there, there are many ways to get started. But I would say, you know, what's good about the Facebook group is you could go onto there, and you could take a look at what others are doing using spiral antennas or just straight pieces of wire. And my recommendation is to start with something, anything, whether you're gonna be hooking batteries up or, or regular 
regular magnets and putting them into the soil or next to your house plant. Try something, try anything and see what happens. And then from there, the gears will start turning. And if you're all vibed up, your intuition is going to even give you other ideas to try out. They're going to surprise and delight you yeah. and uh, lead you in the direction you need to go. That's great advice. And can you uh, name drop that Facebook group again? Yeah, it's the Energetic Agriculture Facebook group. And the idea is that people um, that are doing experiments just share what they're finding, what they're learning, so that we can really kind of pool this information. Is that correct? Yeah, so it's basically an open forum for, for sharing knowledge and experimentation and creativity. I, I think I've always been a fan of the arts. And I when I first got into engineering, it was really because I wanted to do a mix of hardcore engineering, but also combine it with art and sculpture. And uh, that's one of the things I love about the group. So I think the most, on, honestly, when it comes to electric culture, I think the most important thing, regardless of whatever you create, is do you get results? The orientation of the spiral, the length of the wire, however you decide to do it. In the end, do you get results? And those results are probably, might be specific to the plant that you're growing it with. So yeah. if it doesn't work, just try again wires and the means to obtain wires of all different kinds is, is cheap and attainable almost anywhere so yeah anyone can. um so two more quick questions that have come to mind um is there a length like a distance um diameter kind of around the antenna that is affected or does that depend on the, the size um in terms of these types of antennas that we're talking about here, antennas that are simply radio antennas, radio wave antennas, the amount of electricity that comes off of them is so, so tiny. I think they only, I, I don't think they work anywhere, anything more than uh, a few inches. Okay. A few inches uh, away from the plant. And that, of course, depends on soil conditions, uh, how fertile the soil is, um, the uh you know how conductive the soil is there are probably other factors as well so many variables at play but give it a try okay um another thought just came to me um look you've mentioned Lakovsky coils <laughs> several yeah. times um i am i've never heard his name i'm just curious how um i have an example cool Cool. I, I'm more familiar, like the first name that comes to mind, of course, is Tesla. Of course, Tesla coils. So how are they different? If you can talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, I'm not extremely uh, well versed on the Tesla coil, but from what I do understand, uh, basically a Tesla coil is a powered device that has a, uh, a number of a number of coil windings. There's a primary coil and a secondary coil. And they, okay. there's a, when you combine the different coils of wire in different ways, you create a, a transformer effect. And so if you have, in, in basic transformer theory, if you have a, a small number of windings here and a larger number of windings here, and they're connected to each other, either through, uh, through free space or through a, an iron ring, then you end up, if you have like a high voltage here, you end up with a lower voltage here and a higher amount of current fl uh, flowing through, through it, if I remember correctly. Um, and a Tesla coil is a play on that effect where it, it allows you to generate very high frequencies at high voltage, where the Lakowski coil is, instead of, ha instead of a coil that has hundreds, if not thousands of wrappings that is really meant to boost energy to very high levels where the thing's emitting sparks like crazy. A Lakowski coil is the, perhaps the singular singular element of that system. Okay. And it looks kind of like this. Okay. All it is, is a simple wire, a wire loop. And you have two pieces of bare, bare, two bare ends of it that are exposed. And you align this in the, in the north-south 
uh, configuration. I think this ideally this is facing the south, uh, the south pole, and don't quote me on that. I wrote a blog post that explains all of this on my website. <laughs> so uh, the, and that would be different that. if you're in the northern hemisphere versus the southern hemisphere, right? Or no? Probably, probably. Okay. Um, <laughs> again, it's a, my my, uh, my thoughts on this are these things are so easy to make. Test out both ways. Yeah. It's not it's not a big deal. Yeah. So so basically, uh, this thing uh, the the loop itself acts as a single wire uh, inductor, and this little gap acts as a capacitor holding charge. Charge mm -hmm. builds up on the ends of here, and then transfers across, and then comes around the other way, and it, it's just a loop. And so in this uh, blog article I have, there's some animations that explain how the electricity flows back and forth through the uh, through the loop. Cool. That's so simple. So simple. Much and more you, simpler than I had in mind. Completely. It, it's trivial. This is the very beginning of many people's electric culture journey. Awesome. So one more time, um, tell us your website and how people can find you and get in touch with you and, and what kind of requests you would like to hear from people. Sure. So um, when I started this this uh, adventure, um, I have my uh, my mainline website is electricfertilizer.com, but we're starting up a new a new chapter with my partner um, Rayleigh Bacon, and we are starting a new a new website called energeticgrowers.com, okay. and we're putting that together, and we um, we plan on teaching and sharing more knowledge about this amazing world of energetic agriculture and so we will be coming out with courses soon more informational content uh, we're open to consulting and uh, on-premises teaching as well awesome and, and both and Italy he's based in Italy oh awesome and both of your books are available on Amazon that's right okay Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been a fascinating conversation when far beyond what I thought we were going to cover, but awesome. I'm, so, I'm so thankful for your time and your wisdom and for your presence today. Same here. Same to you. Thank you yeah. so much. I would love to keep in touch and uh, hear about uh, future experiments. So please, uh, please keep us all posted. Will do. And, and same for you. If you ever decide to do any experiments with essential oils or crystals and plants, please keep me in the loop. For sure. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye. Have a great Bye. day. That concludes our conversation for today. I would absolutely love to hear any thoughts or experiments you have based on the information that we discussed. Please make sure to comment below, uh, smash that like button, subscribe, share with your friends. And um, if you have any suggestions for future guests that you'd like to see on the Frequency Matters podcast, please send them my way. Be sure to tune into my next podcast, which will be released on June 30th, 2023. I have the pleasure to speak with Stephen A. Ross, PhD, who is a co-founder and CEO of the World Research Foundation. For 50 years, he has researched and lectured around the globe in all areas of health, philosophy, spirituality, and subtle energy subjects. You won't want to miss it. Thanks and have a great and blessed day. Frequency, 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 frequency matters. matters. matters.